All right. Good morning, Australia, and good afternoon, New Zealand. And welcome uh, to this webinar by Locus. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today for Beyond GIS, FME Solutions and Local Government. My name is John Arnrich and I'm the Group Director and the Founder of Locus. Uh, you, many of you will have recently have logged in with us for the virtual FME World Tour events, which we held a few weeks ago, which was uh, a really good success for so many people, both in Australia and New Zealand, logging in. Uh, it, was a it was a different world with COVID-19. We're down to level one here in New Zealand and hopefully in Australia. Our friends there will soon be uh, enjoying the same liberties uh, which we are now. I'm just going to quickly just work through the agenda. So we're going to have a little talk about FME Desktop and FME Server in a general sense. Now we're going to talk about uh, common uh, LGA enterprise integration use cases. We're talking about enterprise service bus, which for some of you is a new usage for FME, which is gaining traction around the world. We'll talk at the end about local government subscription pricing. There's some really exciting options there for you. So we look forward to engaging with you guys in relation to that. At the end, we'll have some time for Q&A and also there'll be some additional resources. We'll be providing this webinar via a link, all of the slides, all of the links uh, through to those additional resources, webinars, etc., will be provided. So let me begin. Uh, for those of you who haven't met some of our team, it's a real pleasure to have Ruby Donaldson and Darren Fergus with me here today. Ruby heads up our Australian business. She's a business mm. development director there. And she's been enjoying uh, the discussions and successes with local government in Australia in relation to the subscription pricing options that are available. Between Ruby and myself, we've got over 25 years dealing with FME. And so we, we believe that we're really well placed to talk to you about the requirements that you do have uh, the needs uh, for your business, not just in relation to a, a traditional uh, GIS space, but then also other parts of your business. With us also, Darren Fergus, who's a senior technical consultant for Locus. Darren does a bunch of work in Australia as well as New Zealand. He also, he's a certified desktop professional. He's also a certified trainer. So you're always in good hands and in, in enthusiastic hands uh, with Darren. He's got a real passion for FME and that comes through with the way he presents, but also in the way that he engages with our clientele. Locus is in New Zealand and Australia. We're very proud of that. We've been our platinum partner for a number of years now, and it's been great to deal with not just local government, but central government, the telcos, the utilities, and a bunch of clients in all different parts of industry in both Australia and New Zealand. One of the really good things about that is that we can see what's happening in each jurisdiction, and we can take things that we can see being developed in one place and suggest or apply in another. So that's a real great value that we think we can bring uniquely to you. Our team is comprised of nine certified professionals. These are all certified by Safe Software, so you know that that's an independent certification process and that you're in good hands. We really enjoy working with our clients to come up with customized data integration solutions, training, uh, and any other on-site assistance that you can think of. This slide is just a, a little snapshot of some of the clients that actually use FME across Australia and New Zealand. We have large clients, smaller clients, clients in pretty much every type of industry that you can think of. Some actually have GIS platforms, some do not. It's all about data. It's all about translating that data from format to format, cleaning that data, making the most of it. And so I hope you sit, sit back and enjoy what we have to present for you today. I'm just going to talk very briefly for those of you particularly who are new to FME. FME Desktop, so FME Desktop is a spatially enabled ETL that's extract, transform and load tool that is capable of reading and writing around about 450 different types of formats. I remember well a discussion with Don and Dale uh, up in Canada when they were talking about reaching 200 formats that were being supported and they felt surely there couldn't be more than 200 formats in the world. Obviously a number of years ago, but that list of data formats just continues to grow and grow. 
If my desktop provides the authoring tools in the form of workspaces, these provide the required functionality for any integration. The FME workspace hosts a range of different transformers, and there's four or five hundred of them as well, which enables you to manipulate that data, as well as web connections that enable FME desktop to provide integration and data transformation functionality. So FME Workbench is the author that publishes to the FME server tool that is built into FME desktop. You can take your own tour of FME Desktop through that link there. Again, that'll be in our slide deck that comes out to you later on. FME Server. So FME Server can be deployed in a range of different methods. You can do it on-premise, virtualization in Azure or AWS, as well, safe allow you to actually exercise uh, the usage of FME Server by, by software as a service. This is growing in popularity and certainly is an option that a lot of companies look at, even if it's only from a sandbox type of perspective, where they can trial things before they deploy into a production environment. It provides necessary job scheduling, job management, notifications, repository management, load balancing, engine management, data streaming, all these things for workspaces that have been published to FME Server. And it's all about making that data more accessible. We can create self-serve data portals where the public can come in and download uh, request for information on property, etc., which really does save time for your staff who might in the past have been providing that on a case-by-case -case request. The app FME Server apps, you know, honestly, you're limited to your imagination. You can create and share your projects across the web, across your own industry, your, your group of people, and you can maintain that consistency across data sets with application integration. It is totally scalable. I've seen many instances where people have created portals where there's been one or two requests uh, for information using that portal. Then one or two years later, those one or two requests have turned into hundreds of requests. And so they need more engines to actually help serve those out in a timely fashion. So it's completely scalable and really happy to talk to you about solutions in that space. That uh, is me for now. So I'm now going to pass you over to Ruby Donaldson, and she's going to take you through a bunch of applications for FME that were found in local government uh, authorities around the world, Australia and New Zealand. Ruby. I'm here. There was a lot going on there. <laughs> hey, thanks, John, uh, for the introduction. So Safe Software over the past uh, 12 to 18 months have been working on different licensing options for its FME product. So you may be aware that they released uh, local government sub subscription pricing to complement their existing perpetual licensing models. So if you're not familiar with how the local government subscriptions work, Safe Software have broken down uh, the package pricing into capped tiers, and then the tier within which you qualify is based on your population level as per the latest census. So each tier has a corresponding annual fee, which provides you with unlimited access uh, to FME desktop and the FME server product. Since they were released, we've actually engaged with quite a few councils, um, and we've also run a, a presentation similar to this one, one-on-one. -on -one. So through that process, we've started to see a, common, a couple of common pieces of feedback uh, come through or common themes. So I'll just put up this um, slide if my computer will let me. So population as a measure for councils, is it good or bad, uh, is one that we typically get quite often. So a lot of the people that sort of fall into that good category are, sorry, just a bit this, yeah. Uh, sort of within those bottom two to three tiers. <clears throat> the reason being that you're paying a relatively low annual fee to receive unlimited access to FME, which includes FME server. So if you put that into context, FME server starts around $24,000 for, for your first engine within Australia. So if you're adding a few more engines to this and potentially a pre-production environment, you're very quickly starting to see, um, <clears throat> starting to realize incredible value. So it's leveling the field 
and smaller players are able to compete with much bigger players whilst working uh, within their budget. So that's not that surprising. Those that tend to say that population is not such a good measure for councils uh, tend to fall within these upper tiers and particularly in these tiers without sort of a capped value um, where it's more of a negotiated price. So the point they kind of make is that population you know, is a very good parameter to determine what the economic strength of that council would be. And I'd say that Locust doesn't necessarily disagree with that. I think, you know, anytime you try to make a sweeping statement or uh, describe like a large a group with just one parameter, you're probably going to get it wrong on some accounts and you're going to get it right um, on others. It's just the nature of the beast. But I think we can all agree that when you try to put something like this together as safe have, uh, they needed to have some sort of starting point. And so given that population is a measure that a lot of uh, software companies <clears throat> that are sort of traditional in this space are already using, you do sort of understand it, you know, you know the ins and outs of it. So it's probably not actually the worst place to start, but we do understand it doesn't capture um, a whole bunch of other factors like the demographics that make up your population. So you know, you still have the same numerous services to deliver, but you're receiving less per capita assistance or you're a university town with less consumer spending. Um, perhaps your property values are stagnating or depressed. And so we understand all these little things um, influence revenue and operating costs and therefore budgets. So, you know, which is also particularly relevant right now with coronavirus, with councils largely being on sort of the front line dealing with communities. Uh, this is getting sort of harder and harder in these times. And so we do take these things into account. Uh, so we do hear you when you say this sort of stuff. Uh, but this is why I think Safe Software are using uh, terms like flexible and value for money when they're talking about local government subscriptions. And when you're reading it on the website, it probably doesn't mean much uh, to you. Sort of everyone says these things. So why is Safe Software any different? <clears throat> and so the reason that they've adopted a value added uh, partner model as opposed to say selling direct is that they wanted people on the ground like Locus who are able to fill in those blanks for you and help educate customers on, on what those words actually mean to save software in a real world context. So we're going to try and do that uh, for you today. So based on our experiences and the sorts of deals that we've been able to do to date, uh, we want to help, we want to describe the sort of flexibility that we're seeing, the different options that are available within the tiers. Um, but you won't necessarily find uh, written down anything. So the second uh, point on this slide is, you know, my council spends X, Y, Z, how do I justify it? So a lot of people have told us, you know, they've gone to the website, they've looked at the tiers and they think, well, I'm only paying $2,000 for my maintenance right now. How do I justify a jump to say 10 or $15,000 per year? There's no real value in this for me. And so what we also know through demonstrating these use cases is that some of you, um, if not most of you, may not even be using FME to its cap to 50% of its capability. We've actually had some councils comment that they're not even using it to say 10 or 20% of its current capability. So with that in mind, the presentation today is designed to demonstrate increasing the value that you're already seeing in say your GIS team and how that can translate to other departments. And so you can start to sort of justify this additional cost uh, if you were to move that to that model. And the examples that we have today do have a particular focus on automation and automation workflows. And so if we can show you that a staff member that's spending say five hours a week on manual tasks and that uh, staff member's earning about $80,000 a year or uh, $44 an hour, and then we take those five hours and we automate them with FME server, you're instantly seeing around $11,500 saving on that person's time each year. And then that person is adding additional value because they're being able to um, get on to sort of other tasks. So it may not be just you know, one person or one area within your council where automation is gonna make real changes. Uh, but what you can sort of do is through uh, increasing efficiencies, lowering, lowering the risk of manual errors, uh, you do start to kind of really compound those cost savings and the value that you see from FME. <clears throat> and when you talk, when we're talking about the local government subscription, it does include FME desktop and FME server. And FME server is not an ins in insignificant cost for most people. 
<clears throat> so safe software are trying to offer it up to local councils at a competitive rate. And so when you're taking into consideration what it can do for you and your organization, um, you, you can see that value. And we, so we hope to address that point for you, uh, point two for you today in the presentation. And then the last point here is what happens after three years? And so it's a val this is a valid question and we tend to get it right at the end when the person's made the decision that this is something that they want to do. It's almost like they've laid up at night and suddenly have this epiphany. Um, you know, what happens when we've drank the Kool-Aid? Are we going to, is there going to be gotchas? Uh, so we're going to come back to the local subscriptions at the end and I'm going to address that point uh, for you. So, I'm switching to this here. So getting into it, uh, listed here are the most common use cases for local governments across the world. There's a fair amount of content uh, that we'll be covering here today. So we're going to talk to some examples of each one. <clears throat> some of sort of more involved uh, examples than others. But there's also a lot of additional links to blogs or how-to tutorials that are listed within the slide. So please let us know if there's anything in addition that you need, if there's anything missing. And also, if you're sitting here thinking, um, you know, Bill from Asset Management Team or Jenny from Finance should be here, but she's not, um, and you want something run like this for your wider team, uh, we're available to do that as well. We've been doing that quite a bit over the last few weeks. <clears throat> so the examples that we covered today have actually been put together by Safe Software. Uh, they have over 100 partners globally, and so they get kind of an overarching snapshot of what uh, people are using their software for. And um, in this instance, they've built out the most common use cases that they're seeing with local governments across the world. So most of the examples that you will see today are North American or European, uh, but I think the pain points resent, remain the same. Uh, so it should still give you some context on some of the issues that you can actually, that you'd be experiencing in Australia and New Zealand and some of the solutions uh, that will translate there. I'm just going to quickly switch off my camera just in case we have some issues while I get into some of these examples. What happened to my presentation? So the first one um, that we're going to talk to today is the most common is the most common use case, which is uh, GIS data integration. So we don't want to leave it out, obviously, because um, it is obviously so widespread and we do have some people who are less, um, I guess, familiar with FME joining us today. So the GIS department uh, is likely to have challenges around field data collection, integrating as-built as -built CAD drawings into the GIS and performing spatial analysis, and converting and combining GIS data with other data types like BIM, 3D models, raster imagery and point clouds. So FME can address all of these and more and has the best uh, support for spatial data. So the, in, the, so the example that we have today of GIS uh, data working to support city services is the city of Oshkosh. They wanted to improve their first response efforts for CART, which is their child abduction response team with a leads tracker delivered on a map. So when a lead is received from the public, this is entered into ArcGIS online and an incident is activated and pinpoints a last known location into their leads tracker. So FME automatically updates it as new information comes through, which allows for rapid real-time decision-making. Um, there should have actually been a screenshot here, but it's sort of it's dropped off. But what you should be able to see on this map is the last seen location with a quarter mile buffer around it being visualized as you would see it within the command center. And then they're able to concentrate their surf search efforts within that particular area. So you can see that with spatial integration being a core focus area of FME, that there are actually um, a lot of stories like this in the customer gallery. Safe Software have loads of resources um, available to address working with GIS and FME. So if you are joining us today and you're actually new to the product, uh, please take a look at some of those examples that we think you, you'll find quite handy. The second example, so second common use case we're looking at today is application integration. So we know that many departments within local government use their own specialised applications like asset management tools, work order management systems, permitting, ERPs and GIS. And so the list is quite numerous. 
The drawback of this is that it can result in data silos because every data set is stored independently, meaning they're disconnected and out of sync. But implementing an integration workflow, you're actually allowing systems to automatically talk to each other, trigger actions and send data freely between them to break down those barriers without requiring a human being to manually synchronize or connect them. And you're still uh, allowing your department to use their best fit for, tool, uh, for purpose tools. So the example they have here is the city of Surrey. Um, we see in this example that they've implemented an application integration workflow with FME to enable the flow of data between systems. This particular project was a water meter improvement project and they wanted FME to orchestrate the flow of information. So when a citizen wants a water meter installed, they make a permit request through Amanda, uh, which handles their permitting. Uh, this FME orchestrates the communication from Amanda to CityWorks for asset management and then to Esri for GIS. <clears throat> so the water meter status can be viewed by the requester immediately uh, throughout the process and the coordination between inspectors, cons contractors, city engineers and surveyors is handled automatically. So we have an, a second example here, which is the city of Levy. They wanted citizens to be able to report a pothole online and have it autom automate FME workflow to trigger the repair process. So based on incoming geolocation data submitted through the web application, this process automatically triggers a work order, sends a series of status notifications to the submitter once the repairs begin, and provides a weekly status report to relevant city stakeholders. So it was a very successful project. It resulted in reducing call reports by 80%, which was the equivalent to 23 days work, similar to what we were talking about before and being able to reduce you know, the manual five hours of manual work against an employee's time. So it's really important. The council has achieved an optimized reporting system through this process with the added benefit of increased community engagement, collaboration and operational efficiency. So in this uh, particular example, you can sort of start to see how this particular process could translate to other services quite easily. Um, so including reporting lost animals, uh, storm damage, trees down, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of different use cases uh, for this type of thing. One of the next examples we're going to look at is, oh sorry, there's also some additional resources there um, if you're looking for more information. So the next example is one call. Uh, this example seems to get probably the most interest when we present it. So I think a lot of councils across Australia and New Zealand are using um, sort of dial before you dig services. So many governments, ooh, many governments are required to provide data to citizens in underground information packages for safety reasons and to prevent infrastructure damage. So creating a fully automated system for this can save a lot of time, as well as reduce the risk of manual errors that could lead to liability. The implementation involves integrating data between many disparate uh, sources into one connected data set, <clears throat> which will tell you everything that you need to know about the land and infrastructure. Some organisations uh, then make an automated system which generates responses to people's inquiries, packages up and delivers the required information. And in addition, the system generates an auditing trail, which is also quite important. So, the example that we have here is the city of Bur uh, Burnaby. So they <clears throat> have implemented this exact system. FME automatically extracts the information from the GIS and asset management system to fulfill underground packages. They've been able to reduce the turnaround time from three days to just three minutes. They're reallocating dedicated staff resources to other high value services, and they've removed the, the risk of manual errors. In Australia, we've been dealing uh, with councils looking to implement this exact system. And I know that Darren and John have been working with councils in New Zealand. So Darren is actually going to delve into this a little further in his upcoming presentation today uh, from a more local, a localised perspective. So there's also a lot of resources on this available via um, safe.com. They've put together an actual blog on it. And so if you're looking to do the same thing. There are a lot of resources out there. Obviously, you can also talk to us for any help you need. So councils are increasingly having issues with the existing outsource mechanisms we find, and there's a lot of costs involved. So this is just one way that you can start taking control of that process 
and provide more cost effective and transparent processes for yourselves. So what are the next uh, common use cases that they're seeing, a common scenario for local governments as we move through technological advancements that are occurring our smart city projects? So many councils around the globe are looking to become more productive through automating city life using the Internet of Things, sensor data and automatic vehicle location data. So this data is often geolocated and contains spatial information, for example, GPS. And cities, for example, are using ABL for fleet vehicles to optimise the operations of first responders and city services. You can also pull data from XML feeds, cameras, APIs, and a number of other sources. And managing all of this data is much easier with automation workflows in FME. So as you know, FME is the best tool for spatial, and these workflows can be automated to operate in near real time. So the examples SAFE have given here are the, is the Iowa DOT or Department of Transport. They've actually implement, implemented lots of city use cases using FME and sensor data. So this is just a one example here. And the image you see on the screen is actually shown on local TV channels to provide near real time road conditions and snow plow information to the public. And they've built an FME workflow, which reads XML feeds, traffic cameras, and other live sources and integrate all of this into a publicly available data set, which can be accessed online. So the automation is used to keep it up to date, pulling it once a minute to update the public facing content. So I do have a second example of this, but it hasn't, uh, the example's not here. So another one is the city, the city of Lyon, which is the largest uh, city in France. They're using streaming data streaming data to the public as well as to local businesses. And using the city data portal, businesses are able to build innovative new services to operate more smoothly and benefit citizens. So to create this publicly available data set, multiple sources were integrated, including sensors, reports, and web services. And the city automates the workflow to ensure resulting data set reflects the most up-to-date um, information. So I will include the example for this when we send it out um, because it includes the truck software that was used within this example where a local business was able to increase profit and reduce fuel consumption, which resulted in less traffic and less pollution. So Safe Software have actually pre-recorded a webinar specifically on smart city applications. So if this does pique your interest, you can check it out via uh, these links provided. Now, our next example common use case is the multi-jurisdiction uh, data sharing. So it's important that we're able to share data between different regions and level of governments for reasons like emergency dispatch. So this means many systems need to be kept up to date and the data needs to be quality checked and complete. The workflow for this involves keeping a lot of the data sets coordinated, which is a process of integration and automation. And data sets need to be synchronized and kept up to date when the source data changes. So the example that we have here is the Santa, Cla Santa Clara uh, County for their 911 dis dispatch system. They wanted to improve their emergency response time and location accuracy in order to set themselves up for next generation 911. And so the goal was to build a map for address points within the 911 dispatch system which always is kept up to date and contributed to regularly by each city in the county. So they used FME to integrate 15 city data sets and public safety layers, and then they used transformers to identify issues like duplicate addresses and sent the output to multiple uh, formats. So they now have a unified address data set in addition to the cities maintaining their own schemas and workflows, and the cities contribute their addresses on a quarterly basis. So this particular project was very successful. It resulted in a 50% increase in the number of known addresses, which improves emergency response time and location accuracy. So here's a, a lot of uh, different links that you can get, that you can go to and blog posts that also delve into some of these examples. The next one we have in common use cases is business intelligence for analysing your data. So there's not a lot of information on this one because it is kind of widespread. 
Uh, BI systems like Click, Power BI and Tableau are useful for governments who want to generate insights for their data and create rich visualizations. And so many organizations are using FME to integrate data from their various sources and send it to BI tools for further analysis. So an example uh, here is the city of Lear. They wanted to integrate quite a lot of their data sets and send the results to Click for analysis um, and to create rich visualizations. So they built an FME workflow to do this and they used the FME automations interface to set it up to run on a schedule. SAFE have lots and lots of uh, different intelligent business intelligence resources on safe.com and the Knowledge Centre and uh, the Hub. So there's a few links here if you're interested in learning more about that. Our next uh, common example we see is governments are uh, mandated to provide open data to the public. And so data portals provide access to much needed information across departments, agencies and citizens. And because of the value of open data, the popularity and demand for it is growing. And so this requires connecting data from multiple sources throughout the city on a schedule and automating it to eliminate manual efforts. So the workflow also needs to be set up to share the data in multiple formats. People should be able to download exactly the data they want in any format that they need, like shapefiles, Excel, XML, and more. So they should also be able to choose which coordinate system they want the data in as well. So an example of this here is the city of San Jose, who were continuously receiving requests from its internal departments and citizens for city maps and information on council projects. So due to the data being siloed, staff were unable to find the data or didn't have the correct application to open it. And so the city recognised the need to offer lightweight, mobile-friendly, self-service interactive map galleries for the city staff and citizens. They needed to find a tool that was capable of integrating all of the systems, both general IT and spatial. And they also needed a product that was going to be able to keep their maps up to date without maintenance or without a lot of maintenance. So after assessing the various options, they obviously decided to move ahead with FME. And by implementing it, they were able to integrate their various data sets, produce valuable interactive maps containing all the information citizens, citizens and employees needed. And this included uh, an affordable housing map, building permits, city council districts, code complaints and code zones. And the city also configured FME to automatically update the maps on a nightly basis to ensure its accuracy. So one of the benefits that the city realised after the implementation was the incredible flexibility which FME workflows provided. So when their chosen output for their workflows, which was GME, was deprecated, FME enabled them to swap out their output to the replacement system, which was CartoDB, and best of all, the switch in the output went unnoticed by the end user. So if you're looking to build an open data portal, there are numerous uh, resources again for this. We've listed them here. There's also more on the safe.com website. So there's also more on the self-serve uh, data uploads. So if you're interested in building a self-serve data upload service, which is powered by FME, um, which could be a data upload portal, a data submission app, like automated quality assurance or plan submission, interactive web maps, or a number of other services, uh, on the safe.com website, uh, there's actually the FME server playground. And so the, in this playground, you're actually able to browse examples of different implementations and ideas. And so on some of the web apps, it's actually got example code in there that you can uh, replicate and use. And so we have free trials of FME desktop and FME server for anybody that wants to take advantage of that. You just get in contact with us at Locus. My last example here uh, today is the digital plan submissions uh, CAD to GIS conversions. So when land developers submit plans to the city, uh, they're validating and converting the plans to GIS traditionally, which involves tedious manual processes. Data integration workflows provide the opportunity to automate the process. So many cities are creating self-service data upload services where developers can submit their plans and get back a detailed report on its quality. So the example we have here is the city of Henderson. So they've used FME for automated CAD to GIS conversion and validation. And this enables their automated digital plan submission process for new construction projects. They were able to free up time 
eliminate manual errors and duplication, process submissions faster, and the added um, have added the validation component to the workflow itself. So to learn, oh, we also have another example here of uh, Wellington Water. So they've also uh, been using FME to deliver 12D as compatible as, as built. They were reviewing the asset management system, um, had key stakeholders and internal customers to define the asset as attributes used to operate, maintain, model and value the assets. And the results were that they created a Wellington Water 12D model XSD file. And the current XSD consists of three water schemas with the opportunity to scale up as required. So as you can see, FME has a lot of support um, in this place. And there's actually a, an ebook available online so that if you, which has step-by-step -step, uh, tutorials, so you can follow this yourself to set it up yourself. Um, and we'll be adding links as part of this uh, slide deck as well. So that concludes um, my portion of the, the common use cases. And so I'm now gonna hand over to Darren. We've been seeing a lot more demand for FME as an enterprise service bus. And so Darren Fergus is now going to uh, speak to that for you. Awesome, thank you, Ruby. Uh, let's just get the right screen here. Uh, here we go. Hey everyone, uh, both to New Zealand and Australia. Um, gosh, guys, I am missing going over to Australia as much as I love my home, New Zealand. Um, yeah, it feels like it's been a long time since I've been over Australia. So yeah, like John said earlier on, fingers crossed you get to level one and we get to travel a bit more and we get to share our stories in a little bit of an easier manner. So Ruby made some really good points uh, about all the different, I guess, uh, different projects that take place. And that is one of the benefits of working in Locus and having a really good relationship with Safe Software. It really exposes us to all these different things. And it's a really good story to be able to tell our customers, especially when they're thinking about new ways to solve problems or solve problems that have already been um, you know, solved in other organizations and the, the, the myriad ways to be able to do them. You know, there's so many different ways to do the same thing. Um, so we're always looking to optimize those things. So look, I'm a very big advocate of FME. I think it's a, a fantastic tool and it can be used for a whole host of things. And I think it really empowers an individual and multiple individuals in an organization to really go and do some really cool things, which really takes us on to what is the next level of FME? You know, where can it take us? And uh, my presentation is gonna be around Enterprise Service Bus or ESB as people know it. So where I'd like to start, I think, you know, when we use the word why FME for ESB, I think we have to look at, well, what problems are we looking to solve? And I always like to call this organizational problems 101, and that doesn't mean every single problem across the organization. But, you know, let's look at in relative terms about some of the common things that are hugely important. Uh, what are the tasks that an organization looks to carry out? And that is really data within organizations, highly valuable, uh, being able to access that, uh, between different systems uh, as per requirements based on individuals' needs or groups' needs within our organization or external organizations' needs. And how have we done that in the past? So where, where, what did we do in the past and where are we at now and where does FME fit within this? So previously, we have to think about you know point-to-point -point integrations. This has typically been historically how we've done things. Um, honestly, it, it, it's, it's bespoke solutions that have been created over time consisting you know, of custom scripts. And those custom scripts, you know, it could be C Sharp, it could be Python, it could be a whole combination of things uh, which make it really hard to obviously maintain those integrations. You have to think about the relationships that come with those integrations. So for example, um, if you've created an integration from one system to another, and there's an API involved, obviously related to an asset management system or a CRM, those things update. So who's gonna manage that type of information? Who's gonna manage those systems and those integrations over a period of time? And you know, and, and then we have to put things in context as well, because you know, organizations haven't necessarily always been as big as they are now. They haven't always had to manage so many different systems and so much data. So you know, over time, things have grown. So we've gone from maybe one, two, three or four different systems into you know six, seven, sometimes more different applications and systems in an organization. And what that means is when you've got point-to-point -point systems 
uh, sorry, point-to-point -point integrations, that you, you end up with a cobweb of integrations and a whole host of things that need to be managed, uh, version controls needs to be in place, documentation needs to be in place, uh, system upgrades need to be managed and controlled properly between you know, what you do with scripts, what happens with APIs, and new versions of you know, CRMs or asset management systems that come out that obviously impact the system. And those tightly coupled systems mean that there's a, a, a failover problem with that. And then the other element of this is you need to rely on people that have the skills, the development skills to be able to build these integrations and manage these integrations over time. And, and that in itself can actually be a big problem. And then outside of that, if you don't have those skilled workers or those skilled workers, as we know, you know, go from one job to another, um, that's just a natural cycle of life. Uh, you, you lose that knowledge and if you don't have that documentation that creates problems and then you have to go to contractors and you know sometimes we're in a position where we get held to ransom uh, by contractors just because you know we have got no other option or no other choice to be able to manage those systems um, so what is the byproduct of this well the byproduct of this with a lack of full integration what that tends to lead towards is workarounds you know it's human nature if i can't do something if i can't do my job i need to find a way to do it and that means that people are likely to go and pull data from you know locations manually and they're going to build upon that and they're going to create data silos and you multiply that but the amount of times the system goes down the amount of times integration doesn't work and so on or the new systems that come in that don't provide information or data to the organization in the way in the format that's required it creates just a real mess, okay? So, you know, with data si silos, you get a, a generally rather messy, unreliable IT infrastructure that provides and produces, you know, inaccurate and poor data uh, across the organization. And that's both uh, costly and time efficient, inefficient. So what is an ESB? Let's, let's try and understand that uh, to, to, to some degree so we can see where that fits in. Um, earlier on, I, I talked about, you know, you've got this cobweb of integrations that take place across the organization. Uh, when I use the word tightly coupled, uh, what that means is that, you know, the, the information is hard coded to the custom scripts that have been developed. So any small change from the API or whatever you're integrating with uh, usually breaks that system and it needs to be managed and changed. And that's a problem. Uh, and then, you know, if you imagine a group of people, let's say there's 10 people and they all have to communicate information to each other and they all talk different languages, you know, you're not going to get much achieved, are you? Now let's say take the equivalent of me and I, you chuck me in the middle and I'm multilingual and I have the ability to talk to every one of them. Each one of those can pass information to me. I can translate that information into something useful and I can pass that off to you know, whatever system or whatever person is, is appropriate. So what that really means in summary is an ESB allows and provisions different applications, CRMs, asset management systems, financials, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to pass information in both directions uh, with each other, you know, so systems can talk to each other, both directions, and it's kind of like a transport network for data, okay, between applications and within a, a, an enterprise environment. Uh, and or you have to think bigger than enterprise environment because what do we often deal with? We often deal with our own organization, but we also have to deal with other organizations. So we have to think World Wide Web and all the different types of services organizations uh, that are available from there. So ESB, what we tend to call that is a middleware, okay? And you know, ESB, uh, FME, Safe Software, when they originally developed um, FME, you know, it was within the GIS context. Ruby talked about it earlier on. She said, oh, we do GIS really, really well. Well, as a byproduct of having to do GIS really well and having to integrate and manage and transform, translate so many different data sets out there, we actually do everything really, really well. And I'll come to that in a minute. So what are the required FME elements that we need from a software perspective to be able to uh, build some kind of ESB for our organization? You know, let's start small and let's work our way up and let's envision what that might look like. So FME desktop is split, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a group of applications, you know, you get that inspector in there. So this is for those of you who are not familiar, you have that inspector there, quick translator, license manager, and so on. But the key one for this is Workbench. So FME Workbench is the authoring tool. John alluded to this earlier on when he was giving a bit of a recap. Uh, Workbench is the thing where you create the integration the transformation and translation. And you push that up to FME server, and then FME server uh, has the 
underlying technology, it's the platform that opens it up to the world and allows you to do, you know, automations and all these different cool things. So really in summary on that, FME provides the interoperability, integration, automation, synchronization, and the data orchestration that's required um, of any ESB. So it's the functionality which is really part of what we know today is the publish and subscribe model where data is published and we can subscribe to that if we want to be able to. So for those of you, and I know we kind of touched on this a wee bit with John earlier on and, and you know, a little bit of Ruby. Uh, for those of you that are new, I, I think I'm just going to read from this a wee bit just to give you a quick summary of differentiating the FME desktop and uh, FME server and just understand these key components. And then that'll bring us into a demonstration uh, where we uh, look at something, a real world problem, and then we can you know, bring that all together. And hopefully that will make sense at the ESB context of things. So FME Desktop is an authoring tool, all right? Specifically, Workbench is an authoring tool. It's part of the desktop application, okay? It's capable of multiple integrations, transformations, translations, or any combinations of such. It's capable of reading, this is actually a real common thing that gets asked. It's capable of reading a multitude of data sources at any one time. It doesn't matter if it's Esri, it doesn't matter if it's CAD, it doesn't matter if it's some REST service, SOAP service, uh, database web connection, you can read a hundred, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be optimal to do this, but you could read a hundred different data types all in one time uh, it, within FME. And the reason for that is because the underlying technology and the clever data model that sits behind the desktop application and uh, powers the workbench itself. Um, but more importantly, the way to look at it is all data, no matter what it is, resolves to one thing, and that is a feature and it becomes at the tab, it's resolved to tabular level, which means it's something that you can work with. And obviously, the more complex the data, the more things you have to do to transform that data to make that suitable. But the long and short of it is that's what makes FME so powerful. You have the tools with inside that work base to work, uh, workspace to work with no matter what the data is to be able to carry out those tasks. So really, the power of FME comes from the transformer. And it's not just one transformer, it's a multitude of transformers within a workspace. It gives you the power to both uh, create content transformations and structural transformations. When we talk about co content transformations, let's, um, let's expose that up a wee bit so people understand. Content transformation, simply put, is you know, changing the attributions of data. You know, so you're inserting uh, one value for another. Uh, perhaps you're carrying out some calculations on that data, so you're changing it. Um, or perhaps it's a geometry thing. So, you know, you're modifying geometry. You're not changing it. So you're not changing it from, for example, a polygon to a point. You're modifying the vertices in that polygon, the overall shape. Perhaps that's a dissolve. Perhaps it's an aggregate, whatever. So that's content transformation. And then you've got like a thing that's hugely important with what we do, especially when dealing with multiple systems. And that is transformation, um, uh, structural transformation. And structural transformation relates directly to the schemas the variation of schemas, which can be quite complex. Does it have geometry? What type of geometry is? What fields does it have? What are all the components of that field? What type of values can that field contain, et cetera? FME, through the power of transformers, allows you to be able to manipulate that data so that you can deal with pretty much anything. So we can transform GIS data, as Ruby mentioned earlier on. We can deal with tabular data, uh, JSON, XML, imagery, different you know raster types, JPEG, uh, PNG, and so on. Uh, we can deal with 3D, we can deal with LiDAR, uh, and, and we can deal with complex databases that, you know, where we have to expose attribution and lists and that we can you know, transform and process them to give us the result that we want. And data integrity is a massive part. You, know, you imagine now you've got an ESB, you know, well, that's not much good if you're written information and it's not correct around the organization. If you are it's still in point-to-point -point integrations and you're transforming, uh, you're tr so you're transferring data from one system to another or providing that to users and it's incorrect data. Well, what purpose does that serve? That's absolutely useless. So again, FME, one of the parts that you can look at is, right, here's the starting point. What are the problems I have with the data? Let's start validating that. Let's start inquiring with that data, start making changes, producing reports about the integrity of the data and what we and have plans and actions and processes to be able to deal with those problems. So over time, you, you go up, you know, it's like that whole COVID curve, right? You said we want to go the other way. We want to go up with the quality of our data, right? And, and then, you know, there's, we talk about those multiple sources, right? 
where might we use that? Linz is a really good example. So Linz use FME. I've supported Linz do some, um, you know, uh, update management between, you know, Christchurch and, and Napier, where their address data is uh, comes from the local government, and Linz needs to make sure that their overall address data for the country is up to date. So they're reading multiple locations. So you take Christchurch, you take Napier, you take all the other locations across the country. There has to be some process in place that can allow you to read all that data and validate against some delta chain, delta change set that you can go, right, okay, this is updated data, this is new, this has been deleted, so that you can manage that, so that you can create the data that you need, the data view, the result from all those variant, source, variant sources. And that's hugely important. Again, that's a power of FME. Uh, the other side of things, you know, you've got web, um, web connections, the database connections. Uh, they're really out the box functionality. I think everybody's aware that, you know, we're going web, we're going cloud. And having that functionality is just something that Safe Software is always, always working on and developing. Uh, it's actually amazing some of the stuff. I just did something really, really cool a couple of weeks ago for our, one of our presentations, and that was using the AWS recognition service. So I can connect to machine learning that's available as a service available from AWS and do some really cool things. I'd love to talk about that now, but I can't. But that's an idea on some of the things that you can have access to. So out of the box functionality, so you've got like OneDrive, AWS, SharePoint, Google, Esri, Agol, Portal, um, you know, SD and all the other different types of data set that are out there, uh, data sets that are out there, or data type connections that are out there. You know, you've got over four, I mean, John said over 450, I just said over 400 odd, you know, uh, different readers and writers and connections that are available as part of FME, and that's out the box. So that means you don't have to develop something. You don't have to build something. It's already there. You can read the data and then just do something with it. That's hugely powerful, hugely important, and it's a big part of being able to make a successful ESB. So FME Desktop is the tool that allows us to do the really awesome things, okay? And think of FME Desktop Workspace as, uh, sorry, not Workspace, Workbench in a Workspace is, you know, being published to server and it is a client of server. So FME Server Enterprise Enabled Technology. So it is the platform that provides us to take that tool that automation, you know, that integration to the next level, right? It gives, it serves as a platform to give us all sorts of extra things that we can do with it. You know, so um, workspace, it provides the integrations, transformations and translations, but we want to automate that now. We don't want to have to sit there and hit the little play button and run that. We don't want to have to use Windows Task Scheduler because that's limited in what you can do. We want a whole host of new technology to be able to leverage off the back of to do some really powerful things. And again, that's leading up to ESB. So what can we do? Well, we can do automations. Automations is very specific functionality that's associated with FME server. And um, so think triggers, you know, internal triggers, actions, external actions, okay and then you could orchestrate you know a number of workspaces both in parallel or in series or a combination of both again this is starting to sound a bit more like an esb right so full orchestration capability with an fme server through the automations and the other thing that uh, just come up recently with fme server is the ability to be able to um write uh, so it's an aut automations writer so now what we have is the ability to perpetuate data upstream okay so persistent data upstream and we can use that and we can keep it going and we can pass that information on to do other things within other workspaces or other parts of the automation or emails or send that or upload a whole host of things and we're going to cover that off in just a moment when i get to that demonstration and john alluded to this a little bit earlier on with server apps uh, FME server allows you to create your own apps. Why might you want to be able to do that? Perhaps you want to use Collector, you know, um, maybe you want to use Survey123, but there absolutely are instances where you can leverage off using server apps and, you know, it might be data collection, it might be a self-checkout facility. Who wants to build a map, right? Who wants to sit there making 100 maps a day when you could have FME do the whole thing? And I know what you're saying. How does FME build a map? 
And this is what I'm going to show in a minute. All part of that orchestration, all part of that really awesome, you know, combination between FME desktop and server and thinking big. And actually, it's reasonably pretty simple. Um, and then lastly, you know, oh, sorry, sorry, two points. So security uh, enabled as part of FME server. So you've got a server, you've got roles and users. And you can always use Windows authentication within that as well. And there's a REST API, which is really well documented. To be fair, uh, Gary, my colleague, does a lot with REST API. He's always looking to extend the functionality of what he does. I don't use that so much. I've not really had a requirement for that. Uh, and, and then lastly, versioning. So we talked about those data silos earlier on and, you know, different scripts. And, you know, we realize, so what we're saying to ourselves is we understand that we need to have version control. Right, FME Server provides uh, version control for your workspaces. So if you've got, you know, one, two, five, ten, or a number of people working on workspaces and working in that development, um, you know, that development platform, you want to have versioning. So FME provides that. But more importantly, if you wanted to use your own, it also provisions for you to be able to use something like a GitHub. So you could connect to GitHub and you can use that. So John kind of showed this a little bit earlier on. And yeah, this is just server, right? So there's three different ways to deploy server. You can do on-premise, on premise, which is, yeah, probably say most popular, uh, but you know, things are changing. People want to go into the cloud. So you can virtually, you have a virtualization, uh, go virtual environment, AWS, Azure, and then you can take your FME server that you've got on-prem and go, I've got to put that in the cloud. And the benefits of being able to do that is obviously it's a scalable infrastructure. It's easy to manage. All right, you have full control over your deployment methodology with your FME server, you know, how it's configured, how it's set up. And then perhaps, you know, maybe you don't have the resources for that. Perhaps you don't have uh, the financial budget. Perhaps um, there's a, a list of reasons. Maybe you want to use safe softwares, you know, cloud, you know, which is a platform or the software as a service. And, you know, you can use that. But, you know, we like to work with desktop FME server and working with the things that you have the most control over because it allows you to do the most within your organization. But yeah, look, it's completely dependent on what your requirements are. And, you know, kind of John touched on this again. So when we talk about FME Workbench, you can see here, it, it you know, it's a client to FME Server. Uh, you got the FME Server web interface. So that's the REST interface. That's where you would go in and you would uh, configure your automations, uh, manage your data, manage your repositories, et cetera. And then you've got the server API, which allows you to connect to and you know launch things within FME server, take control if that's so what you desire. And then server core, which is kind of provides all the you know necessary job management, the notifications, it's a repository for the data, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the server database and uh, engines. And you know, I don't want to get too much details on this, but think about engines like a workspace. So if you have one engine, you have one workspace. Uh, sorry, what Sorry, I'm, I'm getting it wrong now. One workbench. So if you have uh, uh, one engine, you have one workbench, uh, one license for that workbench, that means you can run one task. If you have uh, two engines, then you can run two workbenches. It's like you have two workbenches that you can open on your computer to run two tasks, right? If you have three processes you want to run, well, something gets queued, okay? But that's all managed by FME Server Core, and you can configure that up to, to suit. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, DAL before you dig. This is one of the things Ruby talked about, and this is uh, a common theme across both New Zealand and Australia. And why is that? Because, you know, the members of public want to do stuff on their property or businesses want to be able to do stuff on their property and, and they don't want to blow something up or they don't want to, you know, damage a pipe. What that means is they have to go through another body and usually they're called some form of dial before you dig service. And that dial before you dig service, what they will do, they will take the information from a customer, including their email and the address, and that will pass that on to the organization. Let's talk about Hut City because Hut City have uh, used FME for this specific task and process. And that each, so the email goes to the organization and then uh, that gets processed and then they supply a map okay and you know so uh, you know it's a real world scenario that we want to be able to show something cool and we want to be able to automate it and if we had an esb how might that fit in 
And I can hear you say, because you know how we talked about point-to-point -point integrations earlier on? Well, what if you've got something that you kind of sort of can't integrate with properly, all right? And you know, the reason I picked this is because I think this is a really good example of you know, the power of FME um, working outside of the things that you, would, you wouldn't normally conform to, the things that would normally create complexity within your organization that you wouldn't typically be able to do. And that makes that quite powerful. So Dial Before You Dig is a working demo showing a real world scenario. It works receiving an email that creates a trigger uh, which runs a workspace. It's actually a couple of workspaces. So it's using FME server automations and also the automation writer um, to allow that data to perpetuate up, upstream. And it's an end-to-end -end process that produces an uh, email. And in that email through a direct connection with OneDrive, it's able to upload a file and capture that information within the workspace and send that in an email. So you've got a structured email with a link that you can click. And most importantly, you get a dynamically generated map. So how we're gonna break this down for everybody is we're gonna disseminate the functionality of the automation. And that's gonna be done by, let's look at the automation itself, breaking down the relationship of the internal components of that automation so people can understand what that is. And then we're gonna look at the power of FME desktop and what it can do, especially when it comes to creating dynamic, dynamic content. All right, so it's reactive based on the information getting fed into it so that we can reduce you know, the workload across the organization. And again, we're last we're gonna look at that persistent data. How does that automations writer allow data to be passed upstream in any form of orchestration that might be carried out? Okay. Oops, that's the next page. Let's just come out this for a minute. Right, so this is AWS. This is, um, I actually deliver training. and I love using AWS. I just think it's a really good way to start anything off. But we're gonna go to um, my REST interface. So this is my REST interface. So if I was logging in, for example, this is what it would look like. This is my home page. All right, it's got a whole host of information. And look, you know, for what we're looking to demonstrate right now, that's not what we're gonna cover. But let's just go in here for a second. Let's find, uh, my automations, which is up the top here. I'm going to go manage automation. So you can see I've got a few automations in there. Look, this is just this is just a test site, but I'm going to click on see dial before you dig email to dynamic map automation. I like that name. That sounds good. So here's the automation. So right now, automation is currently running. So what I'm actually going to do before I get into this, I'm going to send an email um, that will be picked up. So it'll trigger this. So right now we've got an, a Gmail IMAP service that's listening out. In fact, I can just show you that. So if we go into here and we look at the log file. So this is it. This this is the trigger here, Rook. So it's there's the email address, assessing email account. It's looking to see if inf any information's come through. Um, and this is a great thing about FME. I have access to logs, right? I can go in and if something doesn't work, I can go in, I can try and find out what's happened, which is really useful. And um, so I've just seen a question coming in there, can we use uh, um, Azure? Yes, you absolutely can use FME Server in Azure. In fact, they're just about to launch a new uh, package that will be to the Azure Marketplace that will allow you to roll something out with very specific specifications to make it nice and easy. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, right, so back to the automations. Um, oh, I was gonna send an email. Apologies, folks, I got a bit distracted there. So here's an address I sent earlier when I was testing. That's actually my home address. Um, you're more than welcome to come over and say hello. But let's just send this. So we are Locus. And obviously there's you know requirements, there's parameters that have to be met. So there's a specific structure of this email. And that's what you would expect from any organization. You've, you've got some form of integration or um, process that takes place. There'd be a requirement set that you'd share with the organization so that they keep to those standards. You know, sometimes that can be hard. And I'm going to send this to we are locus one gmail And then I'll take like about half a minute to a minute before it comes through. And then I'll show you what that does. Okay, so now we've got that listening out. The email is going to come in. This here acts as a trigger. And once that trigger is enacted, it's going to take that email body and it's going to pass that information uh, to this action here. And this action is going to read a work, uh, sorry, this uh, Action is gonna run a workspace, and that workspace is gonna take this piece of data and do something with it. 
And in this case, I'll show you when we, we actually look at the workspaces, it's going to then take whatever it processes and send it to the next workspace. So you see now we're starting to get orchestration, right? And this is just one small example, right? And actually, I could probably... I could actually probably do both these together, but you know, for the purposes of demonstrating that persistent data upstream and just visualizing how the automations work, I think it was quite important to do this. So anyway, one workspace takes uh, processes the data and takes that snippet using the uh, FME server automations writer, and that passes that JSON body up to this guy. So now it's resolved as a user parameter that I can select, and I um, can put that in whatever context that I want. And then that gets processed. And in this workspace, what it's going to do is going to take that address, it's going to geocode it, it's going to generate a dynamic map. So it's a dynamic map built completely off location with a few parameters in there. And you know, it's got the locus branding, et cetera, on it. And you'll see that in a second. And then it's going to send an email. And in that email, it's going to be a structured email that will provide me the link to that document. Oh, here we go. Guess what? We've just had it. Exciting. So now we're going to click on this. And uh, hopefully it's not going to be one of these situations. Boom, there we go. So really simple map, of course, right? You know, at the end of the day, when you put these things together, um, unfortunately, you don't get as much time in the world as you'd like because you could go and do a whole load of things. But, you know, in a real world scenario, if this was Hot City, for example, what they would be doing is they'd be providing something similar to this that's dynamically built within the FME workspace and produced off the data that's available and the services it's connected to. Um, but they would, you'd have you'd have the services, you'd have like, for example, your water pipes, your electricity lines, et cetera, et cetera. But hopefully that gives you an idea. So now if we jump back out the automations for a minute, so remember, we got an email, then we run a workspace, then we run another workspace, and then we template up that information and we send out that result. So if we go to look at the workspaces, so this is workspace number one. I know it's a really simple workspace because really all we're doing in this workspace, um, we've we've rigged it up a wee bit to you know, uh, leverage this automations writer to show the proof of concept about being able to pass this data persistently through the processes that we do. So all this is gonna do, we got a little initiator there, and we've got uh, attribute manage, it says here's the captured text, and you see this dollar email value. Well, when we set up the workspace and the, the automation within, uh, with the workspace within the automations, what we can actually do is we can define what this parameter is and that parameter is actually going to be the email body. So the email trigger comes in, it sends the email body to this, and all we're going to do is we're just going to pass it on to the next thing to be processed. And this is where the complexity comes in. Um, let's just zoom out a wee bit. So with this workspace, I'm not again, I'm not going to go into too many details because at the end of the day, it probably just take too long and it might bore people, but it excites me. Um, on the left-hand side, what we're doing is now we're taking that uh, address information. Uh, let's just zoom in a wee bit here. We're taking that address information. We're going to create an attribute off the back of that because we need to be able to do something with it. We're going to split it out, clean it up so that it's useful because it comes in as um, you know, like a bit of a, a, a junk text. You imagine it's a body of an email, so you have to do some stuff to extract the information that you really want out of it. And then we're going to send that to a geocoder. And with that geocoder, it's going to process that, turn it into a point. Now we've got something to work with. Uh, we're going to convert everything to NZTM. That way it's, you know, NZTM. So that's a common New, a New Zealand projection system for those of you over in Australia. And we're going to do some things. So right now I've got this process here is going to create uh, an area of interest. And that area of interest is going to set the scene for our map. And down the bottom, we're going to... Um, what we're going to do here, we're actually going to create a label. So we're going to do a few things, right? And those few things are going to be sent to this, uh, what we call a Mapnik rasterizer. Very cool. It's going to take the image. It's going to take the bounding box that we've created. And we've done some, you know, we've done some cool quirks where we've evaluated how much of the bounding box needs to be split in for the locus branding down the bottom versus what needs to be the top part, which is very cool. We're going to apply that label. And of course, the resulting output uh, was that file there again. So here you go, see there's the bounding box. So you think about this, there's the area of interest. We somehow need to be able to divide that up. FME gives you all the power to be able to do that. So with a bit of quick thinking, a bit of ingenuity, and a, a few transformers, you can carry that process out. So now we've created that image, 
what we need to do is it's an image, but it's not really an image, right? Because it doesn't exist as anything. We haven't written that format out yet. So it doesn't, it's not a JPEG, it's not a PNG, but we want to create that. So we're going to write that um, JPEG out. You notice this temp path creator. So it's a temporary file. And as soon as it's finished with, it will delete that file so that you're not building up lots and lots of data someplace. And then we're just going to read that back in in its true format. And we're going to extract and expose the parameters from that, the different attributes that are available from that specific data type. And we're going to use that to upload that to OneDrive. So here you go. Here's another connection. This is a OneDrive connection. And it's really simple to set up. So for those of you that aren't familiar, look, I go in here and you can see um, I've got upload. I've got Microsoft OneDrive account. If I wanted to add that and I didn't have that already, I could go into here, web connections, and um, I can just go add and create one, but you can see I've already got it. And oh, there's that recognition AWS. That's very cool, by the way. And then, and then what it does is it sends that information into an automations writer so that then I can consume that in the very last part of the process, which is here, and send that to myself. And this is this pretty little templated, simple but effective. Uh, you know, this is a system generator port. Dial before you dig process has been carried out. Da, 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 and here's your OneDrive link. All right. So I know you're asking, but that's not ESP. So all the organizations and all the examples on ESP, you know, you don't build it all in one go, right? You pick off the things that are the most important things right now within your organization. You build them. And as you build them as a byproduct of the excellence that comes from, uh, you know, Safe Software's FME and the hard work that you put in, you get this ESB. And what we find the most common engagement recently is people asking us, is FME capable of being an ESB? Which of course it absolutely is. And this is one small part to it. So if I go back to the slides now, and we're just gonna finish this off. Oh, I'm sorry guys. Uh, let's go back to that on the slide. Is it this one? Oh, here we go. Yep, it's this one here. Here we go. So there's more than, you know, what we've shown you is just like, it's a really, you know, you imagine the ocean, right? And how big that is. It's like a, you know, it's like a small boat in the ocean about what the capability is that comes from FME desktop and server. So there's so much more to that. And some of the things that I'm just gonna fly through that you need to think about, and I can hear you saying, well, what if, you know, all those 400 integrations that's offered or readers, writers that's offered as part of FME, what if there's something I don't have, you know, what if there's something that I, I can't use? How well, does that mean that it's no use for me? No, absolutely not. So this is a great thing. Again, I keep saying how awesome FME is, but it comes with a thing called the HTTP caller. And HTTP caller is used where you want to be able to send responses, you know, uh, get get um, response to a specific web server, uh, REST, SOAP, a whole host of different combinations that you can use and you get a body and then you know that adjacent body or xml body and then you can uh, transform that into something useful within the fme workspace using the transformers uh, and that's a massive thing because that allows you to use authentication allows you to configure something up that's specific to your organization allows you to integrate with uh, any api so as long as you've got documentation on that api it allows you to be able to do that and then you've got things like the ftp caller so that supports ftp FTPS and SFTP protocols. I actually use that. And then of course you've got hundreds of support formats when it comes to readers, writers, and you know, web connections and database connections, which you don't have to do anything with other than have credentials. And you know, uh, the monitoring, so the other things that you can do with FME. So we talked about triggers earlier on where you know perhaps you use a topic. There's topics available to FME server that you can set up. You can use a webhook. Uh, so for example, uh, as a business I run, I take a webhook, I supply that to Stripe, Stripe then receives a new customer that passes it to the topic, and then I take that information within an automation, I process it, and then I you know, generate a result from that, which usually uh, requires a calendar booking or something like that. But of course, other ways to do that, you, know, you can have topic monitoring, you can uh, have a directory watcher, so you can watch folders, you can watch FTP, so there's a whole host of other things that you can do there to be able to trigger and manage data. And it's more dynamic because it you know, happens 
instead of you having to set a process that's scheduled, you know, every five minutes, 10 minutes, it happens, you know, it takes place when it actually happens, which makes it far more fluid across your system. And again, it's more, uh, it conforms better with what an ESB effectively is. Um, so there's some information in here you can have a look at later, and there's some links there that can help provide additional context on that if you're not familiar with that. And we're coming to the end now. So the other things that you need, well, uh, the email that is available with FME, um, with inside, you know, work, uh, workspace, you know, you can use SMTP, you can use IMAP, uh, you can you can add HTML content, so you can use the HTML report generator and you can attach that to an email, you can attach images, you have full control. And I suppose lastly, if you wanted to be able to send text messages, um, FME has Transformer that uh, integrates with Twilio. Um, for me, I actually use text messaging, but what I do is I use an email or to text service. It just makes it a little bit easier for me, especially because Twilio is not, uh, it's not available in New Zealand. And then lastly, there's a whole host of different uh, other things that you can use. So there's, uh, you know, if you're a developer and you're really good with, you know, Python, for example, you can use the Python caller so you can create custom scripts. By the way, just because you can use custom scripts doesn't mean you should do it, right? If it exists within FME, don't go recreating it because then you just create a dependency, but it's available for there. You should you need to be able to use it. So you've got Python caller, you can use .NET, TCL caller, system caller. I use system caller quite a lot. In fact, I did a presentation last time with the world tour that was really good, R caller. And then you can go and have a look at the documentation for the full list. So that really brings this to an end. I really hope that you can get a better insight about ESB and all the really cool things that you can do of making FME uh, as part of desktop and server and rolling it out into that uh, fantastic solution. So um, I'd just like to say thank you everybody for your patience. I hopefully it's been useful to you and I'll pass back to Ruby Donaldson. Unless of course there's any additional questions. I don't think there's been, I don't think there's been any additional questions, Darren. Okay, cool. Yep. Well, there has, sorry, this, but not related to yourself. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but there has been be a few. There has been a few questions around uh, sharing the slides and the recording and whether we'll be sending out the ebook. So we will actually be doing that for you today. So as promised, um, we're going to delve a little bit into the local government licensing models now. So you can see here that there's a few options available. We still have the traditional perpetual licensing model. Uh, now we have the local government subscription and we also have FME Cloud. So when doesn't it make sense? for a local government to move away from perpetual licensing. Um, so these situations do exist. So if you have already invested quite heavily in FME perpetual licensing and it's fit for your purposes, you don't really have uh, growth plans or projects that you're looking to undertake, then it probably doesn't make sense right now. Um, equally, if you're just starting out, you say you have one person in your team and you'll be growing into it quite slowly. Again, it might be worthwhile to stick with the perpetual licensing, looking to move towards a subscription down the track as your organisation grows. But where it does make sense is if you have a project to undertake or you're looking to grow FME within the council or you're experiencing bottlenecks or limitations with the current amount of licensing that you have or you find yourself routinely buying additional licences, so <clears throat> looking to add additional user licences you know, every year or every second year, then the numbers really do start to stack up. Um, and also if you're equally, if you're a single man GIS team, then FME server is going to be your friend and ally. So by utilizing a lot of the automation and scheduling tools available. So if your budget allows, then it would ultimately be a no brainer in that sense. And we talked a little bit about what flexibility there is earlier. So we've been engaging with councils and regardless of their size, we've been sort of treating it like a negotiation. So it, it's not as black and white as you might think. And whilst it's based on population, oftentimes when we're looking at what we're looking at, what your actual plans are, uh, the size of your team, are you looking to build uh, to build your team through training? And what sort of rate of growth might might that look like overall to determine whether the tier that you fall that you fall within is the expected price that you should be paying. And so through this process, we've negotiated with Safe Software a few sort of creative plays, if you will. Um, so some of the deals that we've done have been stepped. So we're building from a lower tier point to a higher tier point over time. We've also negotiated sort of different prices altogether where it's made sense. 
and sometimes if you're really so if you're falling just within that sort of higher tier um, we've actually been able to push that back into that lower tier we're really just trying to remove barriers for you wherever possible by being your champion within safe software if you will so not every negotiation is successful um, but it's a bit like if you don't ask then you don't then you won't know and so bear in mind as well that the local government subscription is a capped price for unlimited software so some of the things we've been able to do is negotiate prices based on a capped price for a capped level of software whether that's uh, just desktop or just fme server or a combination of the two um you see, sorry you would still obviously have to have desktop but whether it's built into sort of like an ela or a government subscription it can be sort of separated out from the desktop licensing that you have and it wouldn't be unlimited so we're creating a different upper limit um, and then allowing us to fit the price around what your budget might be. So some of the other value adds uh, that we're seeing and that we're putting in place, uh, council, councils have been able to negotiate uh, value adds in terms of services and training and support hours. And we obviously want you to use the software and build it across your teams. So that takes training. And so we've seen, we've seen training services being used to provide additional value where it uh, makes sense. And John, do you want to turn your camera on and speak to uh, some of the things within your market as well? I don't know if, if people know, but John used to be an accountant before he entered the FME game. So he's a bit of a king of kings when it comes to organising subscription negotiations. Is he here? <laughs> All right. I'm just making sure that I'm, I'm centred uh because apparently uh some people could only see a quarter of me a lot of people would say that's a really good thing so i'll, I'll um but here you are in, in full noise but thanks very much ruby for that and yes for my sins in the past i was a chartered accountant still am actually so i guess just building upon what ruby's had to say i i think uh my, my comment would be that 12 years ago, when we were embarking on FME, uh, at least in, in the New Zealand context, and even in Australia, uh, around the world, you, you get to know all the people who are the resellers. There really were only two models that were available. You would either buy FME on a license by license basis and pay annual maintenance, which is the perpetual model, which Ruby has spoken to. And then the other one would be an ELA. And those thresholds to get into an ELA were quite high. Over the last few, really, Flexibility is the key word that I'd put across to everybody. It's basically safe together with ourselves, trying to find a model that suits you, suits your requirements, suits your budget. So instead of thinking just one by one licensing, I guess we really encourage you to have a think about where you are now, where you might be in 12 months, 24 months, or even longer. Because pretty much every solution that you can think of is on the board, and it's an opportunity to have a discussion between yourselves and us. You can get the benefit of the experience that we've had for, as I say, around 25 years now. And then working with SAFE, who obviously we're, we're platinum partners, we've got their trust and, and we've got your trust. So together, it's about working together to try and find that best solution for you guys. One thing I'd say is that if you do have current perpetual licenses or indeed your first purchase would just be a perpetual license, then that doesn't mean you can't get to a subscription model maybe a little bit a little bit later down the road so you can certainly transition from uh, just owning those licenses to a subscription and pretty much for the same amount of money you can get more bang for your buck in terms of the licensing that's out there so again i'll just say total flexibility and it's really a case of having a good chat to us having a, a good understanding if the, the more that you can understand what that uh, requirements are not just for perhaps your part of the organization but others that really helps to try and put the package together i would think i'm coming to the end now of the well, actual, one, uh, I've just got one more little bit so I, I did promise i would talk about what happens after three years uh so we we do get that question a bit so i do want to look at that so get rid of this um, so what happens when you've signed the deal and everyone's drunk the Kool-Aid and suddenly your renewal is up and are you setting yourself up for a gotcha moment is kind of one of the things that comes up a lot. And so I'll try to answer this in the most honest way uh, that I possibly can. But with like anything, there are obviously no uh, guarantees. But what I can tell you is that if you're on an unlimited deal 
and you're in the correct corresponding tier and you're not seeing exponential growth within your population, you don't really have a lot to worry about. But where it does get trickier is where the pricing has been negotiated outside um, in some way or your population is growing over time during that three to five year period, whatever the contract period is. So first off, if you get an unlimited subscription and everyone goes crazy and Rebecca, the receptionist, has FME desktop and you, everyone's got server at home and it's installed on multiple PCs and you're racking up half a million dollars in software, there will be a tough discussion at the end. Um, but it is always still going to be a discussion and a no negotiation. Safe Software don't want unhappy customers. They don't want you walking away from FME. And so there are always going to be options there. And I think as a company, they've kind of proven themselves over the years to be fair and equitable in the marketplace. And they try to work with resellers and customers to find um, positive outcomes. So um, I think that it's just important that when you're engaging with a vendor to enter, when you're engaging with a vendor to negotiate a price, you need to be confident that you're working with the right people and you're in the right hands. When Locus is putting a price together, we take what you tell us in the requirements gathering discussions, and then we combine that with our experience with licensing and local government entities. So we know what a large, robust FME server setup looks like across all different sizes of companies. We, we sort of have a good idea of what teams consume generally based on their size and sort of what the growth rate might be depending on the resources that you have available. Um, so we can see what it looks like, what, what you look like now and what you look like in three years and five years and so forth. And so obviously we add a little bit of icing in that too, because otherwise it's not fun for you. But we do this so that when your contract renewal uh, does come up, that there shouldn't actually be big surprises if everyone is mindful about uh, the usage that they undertake. So it's the same thing with anything. The cheapest deal is not always the best if you find yourself paying in other ways. So that's actually uh, it for me, John, if you want to uh, close things up. Well, thanks, Ruby. Uh, the best thing I would say to everybody is from today's session is to have a little bit of a think about how you're using it for me. And if you are, just in terms of the pricing aspects of it, looking at adding uh, additional licenses to those you already have, or perhaps are thinking that it makes sense to consider moving from perpetual to subscription, or ELAs, we're here to help you to talk about that, to have a look at your situation and, and help you navigate through that process. I'd like to close today with a number of thank yous to Ruby, who's uh, worked really hard in putting this together. Darren, with his presentation, thank you. It's a lot of time and effort that goes into things. Angie Worsley, who you don't see in these presentations, is always behind the scenes from a marketing perspective and making sure that the recording gets done and sent out with our slide decks and certainly that will be coming out in the next few days. So I just want to thank uh, those people in particular for making this webinar happen and, and they're always a success in terms of the number of people that log in and get the recording. So thanks to those people. Thanks very much for all of you that have registered. Those people that have been online listening to us today, we appreciate that. We've got more of these coming in the future and certainly there will be communications that come out in relation to that. So have a good afternoon if you're in New Zealand. I'm going to do some quick maths. I think you might have ticked over to the afternoon there in Australia. So I hope you have a good day there as well. We look forward to seeing you next time and uh, sharing a little bit of our knowledge and uh, experience on FME with you all. So have a good day and catch you next time. Thank you very much. Bye.